In the last episode, we looked at how capitalism works. In this video, however, we are going to focus on the ways it frequently doesn't work. We'll also look at why it's possible it soon won't work at all. Hi folks! If you watched the last video, you saw that the modern economy functions largely through the mechanism of business owners using a chunk of money, producing a commodity with it, and then capturing the extra money that is created when they sell it. They get this extra money by essentially underpaying all the people who produced the commodities for them. And we mentioned that, in theory, owners within this system can just keep throwing some of these profits into later rounds of production and therefore keep siphoning off surplus value in the form of money over and over and over. There are, however, a few reasons why it is basically impossible for this system to go on forever. The fact is that capitalism as we know it will definitely end, it's just a matter of when. Oh, uh, hold on a second. It looks like our friend Bourgeois Pig, uh, hi Mr. Pig, uh, has got a message for us. What is this? Oh, thank you. Oh, let's see. Uh, dear Mr. Rabbit, why are you such a commie pinko that hates freedom? Hmm. Well, thank you, Mr. Pig, for that deep philosophical question. I actually like freedom quite a bit, so let me explain a few things here. Okay. In this video, and the last one, and okay, really all of these videos, it is obvious that I'm pointing out some of the contradictions and negative aspects of our current economic, political, and social systems. This, however, does not mean that I'm an advocate for big government, limiting individual freedom, Stalinism, Maoism, or some other form of dictatorial, centrally planned state capitalism that is the hallmark of groups like the Chinese Communist Party or the old Soviet Union governments. Just because these entities also criticize capitalism doesn't mean they are therefore the only alternative or even the preferred alternative. It's sort of like if I said, man, I really just think that I don't want to eat at Murder King today. And then somebody said, The last time we tried not eating at Murder King, we eat at Taco Hell and it was a disaster. If you are saying we should stop eating at Murder King, you must be trying to drag us back to the bad old days of eating at Taco Hell. So there are, of course, other options that aren't either of these things. In a later video, we'll talk more about the dualistic thinking like this and how it's basically poisonous. For now, however, let me just be clear that by criticizing capitalism, I'm not advocating Stalinism or some other dictatorial freedom-crushing system. I actually visited the Soviet Union for a summer as a student, and as much as it left me with a deep respect for the Russian people, it also drove home the point that nobody should want to duplicate Soviet economic dysfunction or an oppressive state apparatus. Hope that clears things up for you, Mr. Pig. Okay, so back to our main point, which is that capitalism is somewhat doomed to fail. At one level, you might look at this as a good thing, since capitalist economies do recreate inequality every day, in terms of wealth and income inequality, but also inequalities in political power, as well as racial and gendered patterns of who gets decision-making power and who gets seen as full citizens and a sense of social belonging and all that. On the other hand, most of us are tied to this machine in one way or another, and the idea of it seizing up and imploding can be a little disconcerting. Even if different folks benefit in very unequal ways from this system, most of us are tied to it in some way for our day-to-day -day survival whether that's for wages from our jobs or profits from investments that, for instance, get to be enjoyed by the sliver of the population that are owners. So whether the prospect of capitalism's demise makes you nervous or happy, or possibly both, it's important to understand why it is so unstable and what people have done over the last couple hundred years to try and apply band-aid solutions to keep capitalism running anyway. This is important information because someday, sooner or later, we will have to come up with other ways to run economies, and the following videos in this series will talk about some ways to create alternative economies, political, and social systems that aren't dependent on inequality in the same way that capitalism is. Let's now look at two reasons capitalism can't last. First, 
the Earth is finite. Let's look again at the diagram of how capitalism works that we explored last video. Also, I should note that if you think this is complicated, here's a more detailed diagram of this system made by David Harvey. So, you know, we'll stick with our more simplified one. All right, anyway, so in this diagram, something important is not really highlighted. That is the fact that running this system over and over again is dependent on more and more raw materials coming in and being used to make uh, you know, our product, which in our example here is chairs. These have to come from somewhere, and that somewhere is the natural environment. Your chair producing capacity can't keep on growing forever because if it did, at some point, trees can't grow fast enough to keep up. Now the second reason the system can't work forever is a little more complicated and also possibly a more immediate concern. That concern is that this system only works if you can do two different parts of this economic process successfully. First, you have to be able to take money and make chairs, what we call production. And you also have to be able to sell these chairs to consumers, right? What we call consumption. And here now is the problem. The owner of the chair factory, in our case, Mr. Pig, is trying to pay his workers as little as possible so that he can create surplus value and compete with other chair manufacturers. All the other owners of other factories are trying to do this too. However, Mr. Pig and other owners absolutely need there to be people flush with cash somewhere that will buy all these products that they're producing, right? Otherwise they can't realize their profits. The problem, however, is that society-wide, your customers are, for the most part, your workers. So on the one hand, you want to pay these people as little as possible if you're an owner, but on the other hand, you want these people's pockets to be full so they can buy your stuff. How is this going to work? Well, this is a contradiction that leads to periodic crises, and it works something like this. Okay. So Mr. Pig here is making chairs and paying his workers as little as possible. And all the other owners are doing that too. So, once some people have bought chairs and met that need, you start running out of customers that can buy your stuff. And this is important because you can only make profits if you can sell what you made. At some point, though, you run into a problem. And that problem is not that you can't make chairs, it's that you can't sell them. This becomes what is called a crisis of overproduction. The problem is that you don't have enough of what economists call effective demand. That is, there's not enough people out there with the desire to get your product and the ability to get it, right? The money to get it. So what happens if I'm an owner like Mr. Pig and nobody is buying my chairs? Well, there are a few options. One is that I can cut back on making chairs and shed some workers. But this means that there are now even fewer people society-wide that can buy stuff because now there's more people that are unemployed. So this could lead to less effective demand for my chairs, which then means I sell even fewer chairs and so I lay off more people and it just spirals down into economic collapse and the death of my industry. Basically, this is what happened in the Great Depression and other great economic downturns. The problem wasn't that there wasn't enough stuff, but there weren't enough buyers and then unemployment soared and so on. So how can we stop this capitalist slide into crisis? Well, there are basically four strategies that we're gonna talk about here today. All right, so Menard Keynes had one idea, government spending. His idea was to take some of the money that had been gathered as taxes by the government, as well as have the government essentially create new money by running up a deficit, and then pump it into the economy through government spending. And so what this did was it employed folks doing basically anything, building roads, making military equipment, building schools, planting trees, you name it. And the government puts money into people's pockets, and then they can go again buy chairs or whatever other things. Then the factory starts hiring again, creating more potential buyers, and so on. Now this seemed to work, especially in the United States, from World War II up until about 1970, but it also created other economic issues. And while Keynes assumed that the deficit-spending governments would, in the bad times, uh, you know, be spending this money, and that would be offset by pulling in surpluses during the good times, governments found it difficult to actually follow that plan. So a second way to make your industry profitable when you are stuck in a state of overproduction is to globalize your business. 
If you don't have enough customers in your corner of the world, then try to open new markets in some other place, in Canada, then maybe Europe, and then Asia, then Latin America, and so on. Or you can move your factory somewhere with super cheap labor. Either way, you attempt to make it so that your workers and your customers are not the same population. You produce in a low-wage place and sell in a high-wage place. Of course, this has its limits. If you once made chairs in a unionized shop in New England, then move to a low-wage tax haven in the southern U.S., and then to Mexico in the 1980s, and then to China in the early 2000s, and then Vietnam in 2010, and so on, this spatial fix only works for so long. But with the demise of the Soviet Union in the 1990s and the global entry of the Chinese economy in the early 2000s, this strategy did keep things afloat for a number of decades. At some point, however, you run out of both places with ever cheaper labor or places with high-end markets of buyers. So a third way to try and solve this crisis of overproduction is for Mr. Pig here and others to try and boost consumption by convincing people who already have chairs to buy them more frequently. This is where advertising comes into play. Of course, this can pump up demand only so much if folks don't actually have a lot of money. So this leads to our last technique to keep an unstable economy afloat, debt. If you want to pay people very little to make stuff, but you still need them to be able to buy your stuff, one solution is to basically give them credit, lend them money any way you can, give them student loans, make mortgages more available, and make the payment periods uh, over longer periods of time, let them get mortgages with lower money down, give people credit cards, and credit cards, and more credit cards. Since 1970, for instance, Credit card debt in the United States has increased by over 24,000%. And in 2020, the amount of U.S. consumer debt has risen to over $15 trillion. If a large number of people have access to credit cards, then you don't need to pay them more. They'll just rack up debt and keep buying your chairs. Of course, if wages stay low, they'll never actually be able to pay off all those debts. And if they don't keep getting more credit, They'll stop being able to buy not just your chairs, but other necessities of life. And so one would think that you can't just keep giving out new credit cards forever that never get paid back. However, this has sort of been the strategy over the last, oh, several decades. So while these are the four main ways that businesses and governments keep trying to push the consequences of these central contradictions of capitalism a little further down the road each time, it is not difficult to see how these fixes may not last forever, and they also make the situation very unstable. As we've seen during the 2008 housing market crash and the disruptions to consumption, production, and supply chains during the COVID pandemic, these contradictions usually come to the surface when it seems like one of these fixes stops working, when global supply chains are stopped, or when investors get spooked and panic because it looks like some form of debt isn't ever going to get paid back. For these reasons, when economic crisis comes to the world next, it is likely to happen quickly and look at first like a panic in the credit markets. And this panic, well, let's face it, few people outside of Wall Street and economics departments will really even understand that what's going on here is not necessarily a problem with the credit markets, it's really these underlying contradictions in the economic system that have kept being kicked down the road by these various fixes. So, regardless of your opinion of the morality of the economic system that we call capitalism, it is important to recognize that the whole system is built on foundations that are impossible to sustain forever. You can't keep exploiting the resources of the earth more and more each year forever. And you also can't keep extracting wealth from one class of people and give it to another class of people forever, especially when the exploited class are both your workers and your customers. The good news, however, is that there are other ways to arrange our economies that are much more moral, just, and sustainable than both free market capitalism or the dictatorial state-managed economies that are sometimes suggested as alternatives. There are other options that have been around a long time and which groups have been actively building and promoting in different parts of the world today. These contemporary groups can show us how we can create better economies that respect individual freedom, 
and are also just and sustainable. In the next couple videos, we'll get away from talking about economics and focus on the state. And by the state, I mean the governmental apparatus that sets many of the rules and procedures in our society and which tends to support and perpetuate the economic injustices that I've talked about in the video series so far. After that, we'll start looking at the people and groups who are creating better communities and a better world today, and who are challenging the injustices and instabilities of the present state and the present economic system. See you next time.